I'm your host, Henry Arslanian, and welcome to the Future of Money podcast. My goal with this podcast is very simple. It's to go deep in some of the biggest ideas, trends, and developments we are seeing in the field of crypto, and hopefully empower you with this information, and then let you make your own decisions on what their impact can be on the future of money and finance. To do this, I invite each week one of the leading figures of the global crypto community to have a one-on-one conversation amongst crypto aficionados and discuss some of these topics. My guest today is Simon Yu, the co-founder and CEO of Stormex. One thing you may not know about Simon is that one of his first businesses he started was running a food truck. And that is Stormex has been around since 2015, practically probably one of the earliest crypto companies that is still operating. Simon, great to have you today with us on the Future Money Podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me, Henry. And so before actually we talk about, you know, the whole the business and some of your, your views, can you please maybe share us about uh, yourself? I know you have a very fascinating background, how you started a company and the story, the whole backstory there, and then also about StormX and what does the company do? Yeah, absolutely. So I first sort of got into my entrepreneurial background, as you mentioned, um, you know, I was a sophomore in college and my parents had a small business and it, it didn't do too well. So um, I ended up dropping out and I got a job as a bank teller, but uh, having a minimum wage, I couldn't afford rent and food and, you know, paying student loans down. So I uh, ended up selling Korean tacos from my apartment and to kids around campus. And that's how, you know, that evolved into uh, this food truck catering business in Seattle, selling uh, Korean Mexican fusion food. Um, and then, you know, I, I got some experience at Amazon uh, for a little bit. And, um, and, and after graduation, went back to school um, and yeah, I graduated a degree in finance. And I got a job as an underwriter, which uh, at a bank, which I wasn't too fond of. But, um, you know, through my tenure there, I, you know, saw how much bank fees were. And it was just enormous amounts. And, you know, reading about Bitcoin, um because it kept popping up in the news for all the wrong reasons. Uh, this was like 2014. So that's when like Silk Road and Mt. Gox started happening. And um, like it, it was always on the news for the wrong reasons. But the technology to me was fascinating. I thought it would disrupt, Bit- uh, I thought it would disrupt banking and, you know, payment fees in general. So I started getting really interested. And then in 2015, um, I quit, uh, joined my co-founder, Calvin, uh, just full time, you know, and I didn't have much money saved up and I was running this food truck and, uh, like I still had a ton of student loans for my first year of college. So I had to like drive for Uber and you know, just uh, work multiple jobs doing the startup. And as a Bitcoin startup back then, uh, getting funding was really tough because everyone thought it was related to, you know, drug smuggling or money laundering. So, uh, we just bootstrapped for several years. And eventually, you know, towards later of 2016, we got some funding. 2017, we sort of built our own, um, model uh of our mvp and then it started doing really well and then sort of the bear market hit 2018 and uh you know we grinded through the 2020 and sort of you know we you know just kept surviving and just kept growing the company regardless of what happened so we've we've been through a lot yeah i can definitely see you you guys must generally be one of the oldest crypto companies out there i mean literally operating since 2015 we're we're definitely one of yeah i mean there's definitely a lot of companies that are you know older than we are too like coinbase and stuff but uh we we definitely are one of the early pioneers in the space and have been through multiple cycles for sure so can you show me with for the benefit of our audience what does what does stormex do you know what is the purpose of the company and literally what does for our users what is stormex yeah, so Stormex is an application. Um, our goal is to try to allow users to be able to find a place to earn. Um, and so we're using cryptocurrency as a reward mechanism because to send rewards globally, uh, it's just so much more cost effective than it is to send fiat. Uh, for example, you know, we're trying to send, you know, like $10 of rewards to someone in India or China from the US. So it would cost you like $100 in wire transfer fees and foreign transaction spreads and all this stuff. And for us to use crypto as then the back end. Um, we can do it with with a, with a couple of cents, and so you know, for us, uh, we're a rewards platform where you know users can complete micro tasks or they can shop online and earn cash back from you know whether you're buying something from like Nike or eBay or Expedia, you know, on a hotel trip or something, you can earn earn cash back through crypto rewards on our platform. Um, but you know, because it, you know the fees are significantly reduced, we can scale globally pretty easily, and um, also because the margins are much higher from the lower payment transaction fees, we can reward the users you know, much higher than traditional companies can. So I mean, just to walk us through the kind of the journey for a user, right? So 
They go to the StormX platform. They open an account. They go to a certain store. Let's say you went to Nike, right? So I go buy a pair of sneakers on the Nike platform and I make my purchase like I would normally on their, on their platform. And then I guess the user is getting that kind of cash back or reward, but in crypto. Uh, that is the main difference because in technically you, you could have this in, in fiat that can get like a reward or a, an Asia miles type of program, but the benefit in your, in this case, you're giving them crypto, right? Yeah. And in the traditional space, there's companies like Rakuten or Honey that offer fiat. Um, but the limitation definitely. So Honey was acquired by PayPal for four billion last year. Uh, but they're only in four countries. They're in US, UK, Canada, and Australia. And that goes back to just how expensive fiat is. And so we're already in 150 countries. Um, we are a much smaller company, but at the same time, we're scaling extremely fast, you know, because we can be a global company. And maybe can you walk us through how does the process work? So for example, uh, on, if I go on the StormX platform right now, there's a X number of vendors on it. How does it work? Are you guys going to these different stores and vendors and trying to get them on the platform? And what is really the big upside for like, these platforms to come on uh, the Stormix uh, ecosystem? Yeah, absolutely. So, if, I mean, th that's why I really love our business model because it's sort of a win-win-win for everyone, right? So for the users, it's a win because you're getting extra cash back on stuff you would have bought anyway. Um, and, you know, in crypto, you know, whether it goes up or down, you know, if you do look at the long term of like Bitcoin and Ethereum, for example, it has been trending up, you know, for good reasons, because there's a fixed supply or ETH, you know, because of EIP 1559 and it is a um, deflationary asset now. And, um, you know, but at the same time, like for, you know, so for the users, it's it's pretty self-explanatory, like they get more cash back for the vendors. It's great because we help them drive sales. So like to acquire new traffic, um, these merchants would have to, you know, do marketing or do coupons, etc. But instead of that, you know, they gave us, you know, you can sort of, picture us as Costco. So we help them drive a lot of sales. Um, and as a result, they give us a wholesale discount, um, which we pass that as cash back to our users. And so, you know, they give us discounts from like anywhere from one to 40% and we pass um, most of it to the users. And as StormX, we take a small transaction fee on each, each transaction that happens. And the bet, I guess, for a lot of the merchants is you're kind of a source of new clients, right? Because obviously you, you have the platform, you have the kind of the, the, the user base, and if I'm debating between buying some, uh, you know, Adidas running shoes or Nike, and Nike is there, it's on the platform. I can get an addition. I can get a cashback. Uh, well, that's that's kind of a big incentive. And then that cashback is in crypto as well. Exactly, yeah. Out of curiosity, Simon, obviously, um, what is the percentage of your customer base right now that are new to crypto or entering the crypto space because of this reward program? Yeah, most of our user base is like first-time crypto users. And that's why... It you know, as a company, we, we spend a lot of time on user experience. A lot of crypto applications and products right now are way too difficult for normal people to use. And so, you know, we constantly spend a lot of time on, you know, developing our iOS and Android apps so, to make it as easy as possible, like to make withdrawing easy, to make the earning process easy, to make the, you know, the wallet address look a lot easier than it is normally. And um, yeah, and those are definitely some challenges because, uh, you know, like for gas fees, for example, are pretty high in the Ethereum network, but when users withdraw their rewards, we don't, we don't charge anything. We pay everything up front. So, um, you know, we, users don't have to pay like $20 in gas fees, for example, to have to withdraw their transactions or, you know, even the Bitcoin network, it, it could be a few dollars, which could be expensive, but yeah, it's exciting to see, uh, so much interest of people coming in. Um, I, I really, you know, try to emphasize, you know, there's so many different use cases for blockchain, but a lot of time when you mention Bitcoin or crypto to someone that's, you know, maybe heard of it a little bit, they always come to, oh, you know, trading. Like I made a lot of money on Bitcoin or meme coins, for example, but um, our, our mission is really to try to, you know, show people that there's a lot of use cases, great use cases outside of, you know, just the trading and speculation aspect. And actually, that's, I mean, you raise a very good point because let's say if I have, I'm buying a hundred dollar item, I get a 5% cashback, for example. Uh, if that five dollar, the gas fees on Ethereum are probably higher than, than the five dollar transaction. How are you guys doing it? Are you guys as a company absorbing those costs? Yeah. So we have a, we have a patent on this actually. So we figured out a way to, um, use off chain and on chain ledgers. And also with, through our batching processes, we've been able to minimize the fees. Um, so when we send out the payments on our side, it's still relatively cheap. Um, when the users still, I mean, there's still a couple things when, you know, users send their own, you know, transactions through smart contracts, it, it incurs normal gas fees, for example. But, um, yeah, from our side on the 
outgoing. Um, yeah, we, we absorb the cost because it is significantly less. And how important is from your perspective uh, to have, like, to get new entrants to the crypto ecosystem to have such offerings? Like, you know, the rewards program, you know, like, obviously what you're mentioning is a lot of people are discovering crypto because of these rewards program where basically they're getting crypto because of they're doing payments that they would otherwise do as well. How important is this, you think, for the growth of the future growth of the ecosystem? I think it's massive because, I mean, a lot of people, you know, when they hear about crypto from their friends or, you know, whatever, um, there, there's a lot of fear because you have to risk your money, right? At this point, like you have to risk your money into buying Bitcoin and Ethereum, which could, it's very volatile or, you know, crypto is, is a whole. Um, and that scares a lot of people from entering the space. Um, but if, let's say they earn, you know, quick 10 or $20 from us because they booked a hotel trip on Expedia or Agoda, for example, uh, and then it, it takes them down the rabbit hole, right? So they now have this $10 in Bitcoin and Ethereum and they keep reading more about, oh, hey, like I, it's all of a sudden like $22, like what happened? And then they start reading about smart contracts. They start reading about like why Bitcoin's going up, why El Salvador is buying so much, you know, and reserve currency and IMF and all this stuff going up, you know, just like US printing money. And it's just, you know, just it, it takes people down this rabbit hole, which, you know, I, I got really fascinated about and love sharing this excitement with uh, newcomers in the space as well. It's interesting, you know, obviously I'm a, I'm a big traveler and uh, I saw that even on the platform, you have like the, the Bonvoy family of hotels, right? And I just, I was just thinking, oh, I wish I'd made all those bookings that I make using the Stromex platform. <laughs> Could have gone uh, some pretty interesting uh, crypto in exchange for, for those uh, transactions. A quick question as well, obviously, one of the big trends right now we're seeing in the crypto industry, uh, Simon, as you know, is the whole play to earn model. We're seeing with Axie Infinity in, in, in countries like the Philippines and other places as well. In a way, it's the same idea, right? You're doing something that you would normally do in that case, like, you know, let's say playing. And obviously you're, you're getting rewarded for your time and, and your effort you're doing there. Um, what's your view? You think the similarities there are between that model, the whole, you know, play to earn and a bit the cashback model or the rewards model that you guys are, are driving forward? We actually, our first version of the app was being able to um, interact with Microtask. So you could play, you could actually check out and download several apps or games, for example. And then by playing games, you can earn. So we, we sort of did have sort of this play to earn model, but we, we kind of coined the term shop to earn uh, just because, you know, we want to just make it as seamless as possible for people to start earning crypto. So there is a lot of similarities behind that. You know, I think with Axie Infinity and some of the other great companies, um, you know, their mission is to try to bridge, you know, gaming, which is really fun. And, you know, think about um, sort of this technology behind it and you just, you know, sort of naturally learn the progress about crypto. And um, similarly for us as well, it's like, hey, you're going to buy groceries, you're going to buy hotels and, you know, all the stuff anyway, might as well earn some rearts on top of it. So, um, yeah, we, we share a very similar mission and it's all about, you know, bringing mass adoption and awareness to everyone. You know, I mean, what is the, what is the, from a, from a cloud acquisition perspective, you know, from your platform? And I think it's a problem a lot of B2C platforms have. What are the, uh, like, is there like any particular geography your, a lot of your clients are coming from when you look at the Stormix platform on a B2C perspective? Yeah. I mean, I, I really love it because, I mean, right now our number one geographical region is US for sure. And then number two is like South Korea. And then number three is UK. So we're, we're very diverse right now. And then, um, November, I mean, we just had our biggest month because there was Black Friday, you know, here, but then, um, November 11th was Singles Day, which is very popular in Asia. So we had a, a huge, um, a number of users just coming from Southeast Asia. So like Singapore, um, Thailand and, uh, some of the other countries, um, which was really fascinating to see. But that, that also sort of explains like, you know, like honey, you know, going back to it, they're only available in four countries, but because we are a global product, like the demand can come from anywhere and, at the end of the day, you know, it's like what we're trying to create, even if it's a few dollars or like $10, we're trying to just create an extra income source for people. And like Uber and Airbnb, it, you know, there's, it's really great. You know, there's a lot of demand for the marketplace because there's, you know, hotel needs and taxi needs and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, it's still pretty limited because not everyone's going to need a taxi or hotels every single day. But in our case, what we're trying to do is we're trying to give people more money. And at the end of the day, every single person on earth more, needs more money at the end of the day. And, you know, we're, you know, we currently have the shopping and earning and we have the micro task and earning, but eventually if years down the line, we're also going to create uh, a freelance job marketplace as well. That'll help expand and, you know, allow users to be able to find more ways to earn through our platform. I mean, you're mentioning uh, ways to earn money. I mean, to be fair, the the, the cashback pro pro uh, program is you need to spend money 
to get part of it back in crypto. So in a way, uh, you're better off just buying the crypto directly. But uh, can you tell us more about the micro task program you just mentioned? Yeah. So, I mean, we have like um, surveys and, you know, different apps and services that you can try. So you don't need to spend anything in order to get these um, rewards. And so these are, the rewards are typically smaller, but again, we're finding opportunities through customers that uh, like the vendors, like the companies that want to spend money on, you know, research gathering and stuff like that. We're just connecting, you know, them to consumers who want to find, you know, additional ways to earn money. Um, but going back to sort of the shop to earn too, I mean, I, I yeah, I understand that you do have to spend money in order to get there. But our purpose is not to try to force people to buy stuff that they don't need, but stuff that they would need anyway, uh, use our platform and then get some additional income out of that because, you know, we have grocery stores, we have, um, you know, we're launching a debit card pretty soon and then we'll have, you know, gas stations and, you know, um, yeah, grocery stores and all these other, you know, useful, you know, at, at, you know, products that you would spend on a day-to-day basis. Yeah. And what are the, out of curiosity, Simon, what are the stores or let's say type of stores or uh, offerings on the platform that are the most popular? Is it grocery stores? Is it travel? Is it beauty, toys? Yeah, it's actually, you know, it depends per region. But I mean, right now, our most popular stores are um, like eBay, um, yeah, Expedia, Goda. There's surprisingly a lot of travel going on, I think, because people were sort of repressed from the COVID pandemic situation. So uh, they just want to get out. Um, but yeah, eBay is pretty popular. Um, yeah. And then as of right now, I think crypto is still pretty skewed to male dominance. So we do see like a lot of sporting goods like Nike, Adidas and Under Armour doing really well. Interesting. And what about localization? You know, obviously it's a big, for any global platform, a big debate is do you stay global or you actually start localizing as well? I mean, you mentioned after the US, the second market you're involved in, South Korea. How do you guys do? I mean, do you guys localize the stores uh, that people can access or it's a global platform that everybody has access to the same stores? Um, yeah, so we actually localize all the stores per country. So each country has different stores that you'll be able to see. Um, so Korea has, um, actually, we we have a really good list of uh, stores in Korea, like Emart and Daiso and Kyobo, which are pretty, um, like, well-known brands there. So, and then we have, like, more, like, grocery, like, everyday stores in Korea more so than other countries. So it's it's pretty useful. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we're seeing so much, you know, traffic coming through. Yeah, because in a way, who do you think is your competition? Is it the credit card companies with their rewards program? Is it the loyalty programs of the brands? Or is it other uh, B2C companies that may try to offer discounts? Yeah, I mean, as of right now, it's like our current model is, you know, Rakuten and Honey, who are the sort of unicorn, you know, dominating companies as of right now. But because, you know, going back to sort of our global reach uh, and we do have much higher rewards um, because we have this loyalty program built in with our token for example if the more you use our platform you get higher cash back so our rates on average are much higher than any of our competitors which is great um and then the global reach also makes us you know you know better but at the same time um yeah we are launching a, a cashback debit card as well too um using uh, some of our proprietary technology and once that launches we will be you know, competing with the American Expresses and some of the banking cards that are out there. Um, and it, and if you look at it from like the traditional sense, it's more like Chime and Revolut, like those kind of companies starting to disrupt the traditional banking companies. Uh, and for good reason, like a lot, of, I've worked for three banks. Uh, Technology is super slow, are really outdated. Processes are extremely slow. Um, just nothing moves fast enough. And um, UX is terrible. Like there's so much ways for disruption. You can lower fees. You can make the UX uh, much, much easier for people and pass on the cost savings. And there's a lot of room for growth and uh, disruption at that point right now. Obviously, I mean, obviously you guys are offering clients rewards in crypto, but a lot of other crypto companies as well are trying to do the same as well. Like BlockFi launching card, Gemini, Crypto.com, which has also obviously its own rewards program as well. Do you think these offerings of people will be able to get the rewards in crypto will be more mainstream? And then second, related to that, how are different crypto providers as well will try to differentiate themselves uh, with their crypto rewards programs? Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I definitely think it will be more mainstream because you probably believe in Bitcoin, you know, as myself too. I mean, but it, the inflation, especially in the US, I think it's a wake up call, right? It's like up till now, we've seen it in emerging countries like Venezuela or Zimbabwe, where most of the global population has ignored this hyperinflation. But with all this money printing, where it's it's going to be more apparent. 
Um, and to have a money supply like Bitcoin, where it's a fixed supply, where if you know you're an average person that saved ten thousand dollars in a year from you know working your nine to five job, and then having a seven percent inflation hit you, and all of a sudden the money that you ho- you held is worth less, and you know it's, you're going to start seeing that there's a better system out there. And I think as time progresses, this will continue happening. Um, and, you know, for that reason, you know, crypto, you know, will continue increasing mainstream adoption. And yeah, I mean, to your point too, I mean, crypto.com, like, you know, we have a card and, you know, BlockFi, but uh, at the end of the day, you know, what we're doing, I, I mean, I like to brag because our cashback rates are going to be a little bit better because we have the merchant relationships and all this stuff. But the goal is to disrupt the current, you know, banking providers or the ones that are currently providing the cashback systems because, I mean, the traditional finance industry has not been disrupted for a long time and they're offering 0.01% for a cash interest rate while they're taking 25% for a credit card payment. The, the spreads are extremely large and you know, as of last year, there was no more reserve requirement anymore, right? So the banks don't have to hold any amount. So if everyone tries to withdraw, the system's going to collapse. So, you know, it's it's a very risky game that they're playing right now. And, you know, just there's, I mean, but ultimately, you know, there's <laughs> there's a lot of room for growth for um, everyone to take a slice of the pie from the traditional players. And Simon, you, uh, StormX recently, you guys did a partnership with the Portland Trailblazers uh, in the NBA I guess two related questions to that is why did you guys choose to partner with an NBA firm, a, a, you know, a sports team, including the NBA? And second, how was the process? How was a crypto team you approach an NBA team to sponsorship? Maybe let's start with the first one. Why did you guys decide uh, to partner with an with a NBA and basketball team? Yeah, um, yeah, it's funny because uh, now you're, you're starting to see a lot of comp- crypto companies starting to do this, you know, like Crypto.com and FTX, for example. Uh, but we actually started this before you know, we even heard about anybody even trying to do this because um, we were the first crypto company to be the Jersey Patch partner. And then uh, like literally two weeks before we were about to announce it, like FTX announced uh, they're doing their arena thing. We were like, darn, like we could have been, you know, first completely. But it, it took like six months. Um, it's a very long process. Um, but we were really fascinated because uh, NBA is a, re- a very global sport. And um, the like our goal is to, you know, try to get global awareness as a company. And so NBA was sort of the perfect fit. Um, and for the Portland Trailblazers, um, I did grow up in Portland for a little bit. Um, so I, I've been a huge NBA basketball fan as well. But um, we've talked to several NBA teams and they really stuck out because they approached us like, you know, we were part of their family. They, a lot of the other, you know, sort of teams were, you know, we could sort of smell, it's like, it's kind of like a money grab, like, it's just like, hey, you know, crypto companies have a lot of money, so, you know, it's, let's just make a deal and sort of, you know, um, just try to milk as much money from this company as we can kind of feel without trying to help us with our objectives, but Portland, uh, you know, their entire company from their CEO down, uh, we really felt that they were trying to help us read our goals, which is to try to bring awareness to our product and crypto adoption to, you know, the global ecosystem. How does it work? Let's say as a crypto company, you want to sponsor a, a sports team. How does the process work? Do you, go, you use agents? Do you reach out directly? Like just maybe walk us for an audience. Like how does the even process work? Because these are two roles that were until a couple of months ago, completely disconnected. And obviously are coming together in a very big way. Yeah. So, I mean, they have a biz dev team, right? So, I mean, we, got connections and um yeah you start having conversations but it's it's a very long process i mean there's you know a lot of due diligence on both sides and there's you know contract negotiations etc and then making sure the timeline and the objectives and everything like that uh fit together but um yeah i mean it's i mean the sports industry for sure now are highly interested in crypto because you know i mean crypto.com doing a 700 million dollar deal and FTX doing $135 million, like F1 and all this, like just sports. Like I, I, I get inbounds from, you know, different sports teams, like from every sport that you can think of uh, on a like weekly basis too. So it's, it's pretty awesome to see um, everyone, you know, is starting to be more open to crypto and um, accepting that it's a, a very real industry now um, versus two, three years ago, this never would have happened. You know, people would have thought there was some sort of, you know, Ponzi or drug smuggling or money laundering thing again. So um, I'm I'm extremely happy. Um, you know, our industry has evolved so far. It's amazing, Simon. We went for it in one year ago where there was no collaboration between crypto and sports teams. Nearly them 
uh, emailing you and trying to get in touch with you, which is quite remarkable from that perspective. Well, Simon, that's all the time we have. We're going to do another fire round question. Uh, really, I'll, I'll ask you some quick questions where I need like literally one or two word answers. And uh, unfortunately, I, I forgot my bell today, but we're going to have this like uh, my stick will be today. My pen, which we're going to be actually, it's a, you know, Christie's pen for some reason. Yeah. will be the, the <laughs> we'll, we'll stop it there. Uh, every, every, like, you know, so we'll make sure that you can answer quickly. Are you ready? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, the, uh, obviously you were in fusion food. You're in the food truck business before. What is the best combination of fusion food you think in the world right now? Korean Mexican. <laughs> Which is what you were doing, right? Yeah. Yeah. It, it's delicious. Um, you have to try it. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Obviously you had a food truck before. What is the best food truck you've ever had? Except not your own. What is the best food truck experience you've ever had around the world? Oh man. I honestly just love good old Mexican trucks um like i go to la and i just go to the you know sketchiest one you know that <laughs> it ends up being the best tasting taco ever so <laughs> yeah love it uh, obviously Starbucks has been around since 2015 what is the most difficult thing in the past six years of running Stormex? uh uncertain regulatory landscape i think i mean in the u.s for example there's you know like five entities trying to regulate the space so we keep getting pulled in different directions and there's no certain regulations you know, IRS is saying it's a property, you know, SEC is saying it's a security, you know, the other departments are calling it a commodity. So it's, it's tough, but we need just clear guidance to help, you know, companies and entrepreneurs to be able to you know, just navigate through. Awesome. Outside of, uh, outside of the Stormex platform, what is the other crypto platform you admire the most? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, I mean, I, I personally really like Voyager right now in terms of like just being able to buy and sell like crypto. Um, and they do have a good use case where, you know, if you have enough of their tokens, um, you can get some additional rates and stuff like that as well, too, which is pretty useful. So Interesting. Uh, I mean, when you're not running Stormex, what, what's your favorite thing to do on a weekend or to, to relax? Um, I like watching TED Talks and just watching uh, documentaries and stuff on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> well, which is my next question. If there's one, your favorite series on Netflix or your favorite uh, kind of show or or people to follow on YouTube. What's the one thing you recommend people watch on Netflix or YouTube? Um, I, I, I really like, I've been really watching a lot of um, like I, at CNBC has this great series of like all the companies and failures and what they did. And it, it's really fascinating because like every industry you can sort of see, you know, deep inside of like all the struggles that they had to go through and all the challenges that they overcame. And, you know, even looking at some of the earlier stuff from like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk is super fascinating to me. So, I mean, it's, it's hard to say one specific thing, but just knowledge is power. If you don't spend time just watching cat videos all day, there's a lot to learn from YouTube. So I totally agree. I, I know exactly which videos are talking about. I'm a big fan of those, uh, those as well. Okay. The uh, next one, if you can have lunch, you can have lunch or dinner with one person dead or alive. Who would it be Simon lunch uh, or dinner with one person dead or alive? I, I'd probably say Jeff Bezos. Um, I, I think he has a mentality that's very customer centric and I, I don't think he's very involved in crypto too much, but I'd love to hear his perspective on, you know, if he were trying to build a crypto company, what he would do to try to win over the customers. Great one. And Simon, you, the last question for today, if uh, there's obviously a lot of uh, students and people at university who listen to this podcast if there's one course you recommend students take at university, what is that one course they should take? I, I'm a very anti-school type of person because, um, I mean, school doesn't really help you apply in, in life, real life decisions a lot. But, I mean, just find something that you're truly passionate in. And there's a lot of great resources like Coursera and, um, you know, just other online learning platforms. And, again, going back to YouTube, there's you could learn anything you want on the Internet and there's no limitation much as learn at your own pace uh, for the sake of being interested. So yeah, knowledge is power. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. I'm not sure a lot of these universities will appreciate that, but I totally agree with you. I think there's a lot of, uh, uh, the, 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 the legacy uh, academic platforms are really need to catch up. So hey, you guys, that was Simon Yu, again, the co-founder and CEO of Stormex. Uh, Simon, it was great to have you on board today with, with us. Where can, where can people find you? How can people keep in touch with you? Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, you know, Simon Yu, uh, Stormax, or Twitter. Uh, my handle is Simon Y-U-S-E-A, so Simon U-C. So. Awesome.
Thank you very much, everybody. Again, uh, if, uh, thank you again for all the listeners who are tuning in uh, this week. Again, make sure to click subscribe and give us a five-star rating if you like this podcast. Trust me, it really helps us a lot, especially when it comes to discoverability of the podcast. As well, if you want to stay on top of the latest developments on crypto and the future of money, uh, make sure to follow me on LinkedIn and Twitter, especially for my weekly crypto capsule show uh, where I summarize the global crypto developments you need to know in less than 60 seconds. And of course, if you like my newsletter as well, don't forget to subscribe on LinkedIn or review uh, to my weekly newsletter called The Future of Money, where I share the three big ideas that you need to know on the future of money and education. Simon mentioned crypto education and education more broadly on YouTube. If you want to learn more about crypto, uh, make sure to also check out my YouTube channel, uh, where I have not only videos of previous interviews, and the one with Simon will be on today as well, but a lot of crypto educational videos. And the good news now is all my content is, av- is available not only in English, but also in French, Spanish, Arabic, and Mandarin Chinese on my various YouTube channels as well. So thank you very much, Simon, and thank you very much to everybody. Uh, that was the Future of Money podcast, and see you all next time, and see you soon, Simon.